Okay, carrying on with the recording then, folks. So this is questions 11 to 20 of the May 27, uh, time zone 2, paper 1. So which metal has the strongest metallic bond? Looks like we're still on periodicity at the moment. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium. So they're all group 1. Going down the group, the metallic bonding gets weaker, and that's where they have lower melting points. And the reason for that is lithium is a smaller atom, so there'll be a shorter distance between the positive nucleus and the delocalized electrons, which is what your metallic bond is. So we're going to go with A, the smallest one. Which is the first step in the CFC, that's chlorofluorocarbon, catalyzed destruction of ozone in ultraviolet light. So remember, that's where uh, the molecule breaks apart uh, to form chlorine radicals. So... This one's wrong. This one shows a homo, uh, sorry, a heterolytic fission where basically the carbon chlorine bond has broken with the movement of both electrons onto the chlorine, leaving the carbon with a positive charge and the chlorine with a negative charge. So it's not that one. This one, this one looks about right where instead what's happened is one of the electrons has gone off and then terribly drawn there. So. One of the electrons has gone to the chlorine, then one of the electrons has gone to the carbon. And then, yet yeah, we'll end up with those two radical species there with their unpaired electrons, so this one's looking good. This one, uh, well, again, that's showing the fluorine having broken, and the carbon-fluorine bond is very strong, so it's not the fluorine bond breaking. Carbon-fluorine bonds are very strong, so it's not this. And again, for the same reason, carbon-fluorine bonds are strong, they do not break. In fact, one of the replacements of CFCs was where they started replacing them with things like CH2, uh, F2 so CH2 F2 and that's basically uh, they're a bit more stable so terribly drawn again kind of multitask don't do too many things so there we go so B is the right answer okay and we'd end up with those two radicals which statement is correct sigma bonds are formed only by the combination of S atomic orbitals but that's nonsense you know you can get P orbitals overlapping with each other as in fluorine you can get sp3 orbitals overlapping with each other, so that's nonsense. Pi bonds can be formed in the absence of sigma bonds. No, they can't. You have to have a sigma bond first to attach the two atoms. Only then can you get the extra bond, which is the pi bond that makes a double bond, or the two extra pi bonds that make the triple bond. Uh, so they can't be formed in the absence of sigma bonds. Pi bonds are formed parallel to the axis between atoms. That one sounds good to me, because again, imagine if we've got a carbon-carbon single bond. Now there's your sigma bond. At 90 degrees to that, and then what you'd have out here, let's say if it was ethene, would be your hydrogens. Where well, the pi bond would form with the two p orbitals, which are perpendicular at 90 degrees to uh, this bond. So there's our pi, there's our sigma, and of course this is the same pi bond, it's just the one pi bond, so it's looking good. Pi bonds are formed only by the combination of hybrid orbitals. Uh, well, no, we want p orbitals. P orbitals, not hybrid orbitals, overlapping sideways is the definition of a pi bond, as shown here. So that's a nonsense. So we're looking for C. Number 14, what can be deduced from this reaction profile? So we've got reactants, products. Products are lower in energy, so this is an exothermic reaction because delta H is down, so it's exo. And then basically the products are more stable because they're lower in energy. So which matches that? The, pro the reactants are less stable. Well, that's correct, and the products and the reaction is exothermic. So that looks pretty good to me. Let's just rule the others out. The reactants are less stable than the products. Uh, that's true. The reaction is endothermic. That's false. The reactants are more stable than the products. That's false, and the reaction is endothermic. And then this one here, the reactants are more stable than the products. Uh, no, they're not. And the reaction is endothermic. Well, that's uh, doubly wrong, that one there. Okay, so we've got to go with A. What can be deduced from the fact that ozone absorbs uh, ultraviolet radiation in the region of 340 nanometers and molecular oxygen in the region of 242 nanometers? Well, that's a longer wavelength, sorry, shorter wavelength. And remember, if it's a shorter wavelength, that's a higher energy. Okay, because the smaller the wavelength is, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. And if we remind ourselves, we've got an OO double bond, whereas in, of course, ozone, there is no double bond. The bonds are somewhere in between a single and a double and are therefore going to be weaker. So let's have a bit of a look through this. The bond between... So what can be deduced from the fact that ozone absorbs uh, this higher energy... Sorry, that ozone absorbs the lower energy uh, form of light there, that molecular oxygen, so O2, this absorbs 
uh, a higher energy, which is the shorter wavelength. So we can infer that the bond between atoms of molecular oxygen is a double bond. Uh, well, that kind of sounds reasonable. So can we deduce it from that? Okay, so it says it's a double bond. That is a correct statement, but is that the best answer? I'm going to put a question mark there for now. Uh, the bonds in ozone are delocalized. Well, again, that is a correct statement, but does it actually sort of, is it supported by this statement? So again, a question mark. Uh, the bonds between o atoms in ozone are stronger than those in molecular oxygen. Uh, well, no, it doesn't support that because we see that we need a higher energy form of light to break the bond in oxygen. Uh, so that's incorrect. Uh, the bonds between atoms in molecular oxygen need more energy to break. But that is supported by this statement. The fact that we need a higher energy to cause the bonds to break in molecular oxygen than we do in ozone. So this will be the right answer. Cool. Although those are correct statements, they're not actually necessarily supported by the information there. Sixteen, the Born Harbor cycle of potassium oxide is shown below. Uh, which expression represents the lattice enthalpy in kilojoules per mole? So we want to get from there to there, but of course we don't know that, so we've got to go this alternative route instead. So if we come up there, the arrow's going in the wrong direction, so you're going to have to change the sign. So again, if I sketch it out, that would be plus 361. We change the sign to flip the arrow. And then going up here, sign's in the right direction, so that's plus 428. Going up the next one, the sign's in the right direction, so that's plus... 838 and going up there again the arrows in the right direction so that's fine so that becomes plus 612 so matching what with what's on the left so there is no plus 361 but we can see that well we've got a minus minus so that would make it plus so it can't be this one can't be this one so then it's between these two they're both plus 428 plus 838 but then it's the difference in the 612 so this one is plus 612 which is what matches what i've got so b is going to be the right answer Okay, because that bit is wrong. Which ion's hydration energy is the most exothermic? Uh, so I would go with lithium. Remember, lithium is at the top of the uh, reduction electrode uh, potentials because, not because it's more reactive than sort of potassium or cesium, but just because the fact that it sort of forms uh, such a sort of a stable uh, or a strong attraction with neighboring water molecules when it undergoes hydration. So the lithium ion, because it's very, very small, it forms very strong uh, electrostatic attractions with the neighboring water molecules, which then makes that process very exothermic. So I would go with this one here. Sodium is a larger ion. Bromide and iodide are also very, very large ions. They will not form strong attractions with the water molecules, particularly. Same as you have with ionic bonds, okay? If you have ions with smaller ions with larger charges they will form stronger ionic bonds so a similar idea here we've got a small ion that's going to form a strong attraction with a polar water molecule when it comes to hydrating it that'll be 17. Uh, Questions 18 and 19 refer to the following reaction. Calcium carbonate reacting with 2HCl gives you calcium chloride plus water plus CO2. Which change does not increase the initial rate of reaction when calcium carbonate is added to excess HCl? Uh, a decrease in the size of the calcium carbonate particles. Well, that would increase the rate. Uh, so it's not that one. That would increase the rate because they'd have a larger surface area. Uh, what about this increase in the temperature? Well, again, that would increase the rate. So it's not this one because a higher temperature is a faster rate. Increase the concentration of the acid, but keep the same volume. Uh, so we'd have the same number of moles of HCl present, which is in excess anyway. Uh, but the concentration, crucially, has been increased. If you increase the concentration, you increase the frequency of collisions, you'd increase the rate. So it's not this one. So what about this one? Increase in the volume of HCl, but the same concentration. So it's in excess anyway. You wouldn't get any more gas produced, but it's the same concentration, crucially. So the same concentration means it's going to uh, react at the same speed, uh, because all we've done is just added the same volume, uh, sorry, a larger volume of the same concentration. So we're going to go with D. Which methods can be used to monitor the progress of this reaction, a change in colour of this reaction mixture? Uh, well, no, there's nothing coloured in there. Uh, that's a white solid. Um, okay, it forms a colourless solution. But um, I wouldn't count that as a, a change in colour. You can tell me how long it took for it all to dissolve, I suppose, if the, uh, it's in excess hydrochloric acid. But I wouldn't go for the change in colour. 
a change in mass, well, there's a gas produced, so the mass of the reaction will decrease as the carbon dioxide gas escapes, so that sounds good. And as there's a gas escape in, we can measure the change in volume, so I would go with two and three only. And then number 20, what is true of an Arrhenius plot of natural log of K, Y axis against one over the temperature? Uh, so if we remind ourselves, what is that? Well, K equals A to the minus EA over RT, which isn't particularly helpful, but when you put it in a logarithmic form, you get natural log of K is natural log of A minus EA over RT. And then if you kind of think of it as being like a sort of a, a linear equation, you've got Y is the natural log of K, uh, natural log of A is the intercept, and then basically if x is 1 over t, then m is the rest of that. So that would be minus Ea over r. Okay? Remember when you plot a graph, you're always done it down in that quadrant, and because the gradient is negative, the fact that that is negative means you get a positive activation energy. Okay? But the gradient itself doesn't give you the activation energy, it gives you minus Ea over r. So you've got to multiply the gradient by the gas constant, r, and then... Uh, divide by a thousand to convert to kilojoules per mole. So, uh, first one, the graph goes through the origin. Well, I've, the way I've drawn it there, it looks like it will, but that's not a prerequisite, because where it goes through the origin will actually be the natural, uh, sorry, where it goes through the y-axis will actually be the natural log of A. So, uh, I've all drawn it there like it's going to go through the origin. Might have been better to kind of draw it more like that. Uh, the activation energy can be determined from the gradient. Uh, well, yes, it can. So it's not equal to the gradient, but it can be determined from the gradient. So that's looking good at the moment. Let's just check the others uh, don't make sense. So the intercept on the x-axis is the activation energy. Uh, well, no, that's a nonsense. The intercept on the y-axis is the frequency factor A. Uh, well, it is through of A, but it's not A itself. It's the natural log of A because of uh, the expression here. So that's wrong. That would actually be the natural log of A, so we're going to go with B as being the right answer. And that's that video done.